Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. We're so excited that you're all here. Just a reminder for those of you who are joining us by WebEx, if you have questions or comments for our speaker at any time, feel free to enter them into the chat box. And I'll turn things over to Dr. Lowe to introduce our lectureship and our speaker for today. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for our annual Abelson Lecture. As a reminder, uh, for those of you who um, haven't been here for all that long, um, Herb Abelson is a luminary in pediatric oncology. He was actually responsible for discovering the BCR Abel uh, fusion gene, um, and uh, this has been a seminal um, oncofusion protein in leukemia that we treat now with targeted therapies. Um, this endowment was established a long time ago. Um, and uh, Dr. Abelson was here with us uh, at Seattle Children's as Department Chair of Pediatrics from 1983, I think, to 1995. In any case, I'm delighted to welcome a friend, an old friend and colleague, uh, Dr. David Malkin, to deliver our annual lecture. Um, David's a professor of pediatrics and medical biophysics in the Faculty of Medicine, University of Toronto. He holds the CIBC Children's Foundation Chair in Child Health Research. He is a staff oncologist, so he is still seeing patients actively in the Division of Hematology and Oncology, and he's director of the Cancer Genetics Program, as well as a senior scientist in the Genetics and Genome Biology um, Program at the Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto. Um, Dr. Malkin co-leads the Sick Kids Precision Child Health Initiative. He co-directs the Sick Kids Cancer Sequencing Program, which integrates next generation sequencing into the clinical care of children with cancer. And he's director of the Pan-Canadian Precision Oncology for Young People Initiative, which is establishing a pipeline to incorporate next gen sequencing into novel clinical trials for children and young adults with hard to cure cancers across the entirety of Canada. His research focuses on the genetic mechanisms of childhood cancer susceptibility, particularly in the context of TP53 and lee fraumini syndrome. Recently, his work has addressed the application of genomics to clinical surveillance and treatment approaches for children and adults at genetic high risk for cancer. His research is funded by a variety of agencies, and he's published over 300 peer-reviewed manuscripts. He has received numerous awards recognizing his clinical research and mentorship work, most recently being elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 2022 and a Queen's Platinum Jubilee Community Award in 2023. For those of you who do not remember, uh, Queen Elizabeth was actually the titular head of Canada <laughs> until her death, and now it's King Charles. Anyway, that was a trivial fact. Okay, so, so welcome, David, to Seattle, and thank you so much for making the trip. <laughs> Thanks uh, very much, Mignon, and um, I'm, uh, I, won't, I won't take that as a um, uh, discussion of our political system up in Canada, but it is still a little weird that uh, we have a king. Um, anyway, uh, what can you do? <laughs> we have our issue. So um, thank you very much. It's a great honor to uh, be invited to give the um, uh, Abelson um, Endowed Lecture today. And, uh, and I'm thrilled to be here and looking forward to uh, seeing a number of people through the day and visiting the hospital. We're building a new uh, hospital at SickKids in Toronto. The uh, picture on the right hand of the screen, or left hand of the screen, is, is the current sort of patient tower. Uh, and um, the architects and designers have been to Seattle Children's a number of times uh, looking at your beautiful campus. and. Uh, who knows, we might have a twin. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I have no uh, disclosures uh, at all, but I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes or so um, uh, giving you sort of highlights uh, from three key examples of, of diseases that are, um, in a couple of cases, relatively common and a couple not so common, uh, that really exemplify uh, the potential and the importance of understanding and studying hereditary cancer um, and uh, the implications that has to uh, early detection, to surveillance, and even to the uh, potential for, for uh, prevention of, of cancer in people who are at high risk. Um, and while these, uh, this, these are pediatric grand rounds, uh, many of the lessons that we learn um, really have significant implications in the adult world, and I think a lot of us like to think that pediatrics leads the way when it comes to uh, medical discovery and uh, application, and hopefully you'll um, feel that as well. So um, we'll start off, this is about hereditary cancer, but we're going to start off with a slightly unusual pedigree, and that is that the field of hereditary cancer really started with uh, Fred Lee and Joe Fraumani. Uh, Dr. Lee is on the uh, um, left-hand side here, and Dr. Fraumani, who's uh, just had his 90th birthday, is uh, still um, alive and well and uh, interested in what goes on um, uh, out at the NIH. 
Uh, and then there are a lot of uh, people who focus on adult um, aspects of cancer predisposition. These are just a number of those who've really led the way uh, over the last number of years, many of them trained by Fred and or Joe. Uh, there are the counselors who are critical to any sort of work in um, hereditary cancer predisposition, um, both genetic counselors as well as the uh, psychologists uh, who try to understand the implications of what we talk about. And one of the most remarkable things is the absolute integration of the clinical work and the fundamental basic science of, uh, of uh, cancer biology, and these are many of the people primarily in the field of P53 um, who, who work, and, and now we work very closely together with them. And then, of course, because we're in a pediatric setting, there's um, expertise across the pediatric space uh, worldwide. And so really the pedigree is uh, quite, quite enormous. Um, I should tell you, this slide took longer to put together than the entire rest of my presentation. <laughs> Uh, so, um, how, how common is the context of predisposition? Well, there's a number of um, uh, uh, genome-based studies, uh, NGS studies, that have um, uh, been published over the years and continue to be both institutional, national, and international in nature. And they've all come out with more or less the same um, numbers, which at, at least 17 percent, and I would argue it's going to be much higher than that, of um, children uh, have an underlying single gene um, pathogenic or lightly pathogenic variant, uh, which is causative of their particular cancer, uh, with or without a family history. Um, the likelihood is that this number will increase as we get better and better at deep sequencing, as we look into um, other areas of the gene, not just the exomes, uh, the coding region, uh, and then as we start thinking of polygenic uh, interactions of genes. But at least at the moment, uh, this is getting close to 20 plus percent, um, one in five. Um, on the left is sort of a table showing a variety of the alterations. This is from our study that we published uh, earlier this year. Um, and, uh, and, and the importance of this is that not only that we're identifying these, that's in and of itself of interest and goes to cascade testing of family members, but there are treatment implications because many of the alterations that we find in the germline uh, are potentially druggable. And uh, I'll touch on uh, this one in particular um, shortly, the immune checkpoint inhibitors. But one of the interesting ones is these uh, agents, PARP inhibitors, which target things like BRCA uh, and CHECK2 and PALB, which are always thought to be adult genes. They're, they're associated with hereditary breast ovarian cancer. And when they pop up in the pediatric population now, it raises a question, was, what do we do about it? Like, are these actually targets that we could uh, potentially use for, for therapy? Um, so the implications are huge. And the second uh, uh, important piece is, this is a little bit hard to read, as I realize a little faint, but from an international study look at, looking at medulloblastoma, the most common pediatric brain tumor, um, if you look in the germline, in this case it was over 1,000 patients were uh, sequenced, there are variants in a variety of different genes in the germline, which are in all the different colors here. And what this is is a Kaplan-Meier curve showing that depending on the variant that the individual carries, their outcome can be strikingly different. And so the example here is that they have an alteration of the BRCA2 gene, virtually 100% survival. Whereas if they have a variant in the P53 tumor suppressor gene, virtually all of them die. And so knowing what the germline is can give you a lot of information of what their clinical outcome may be, and therefore uh, one can start adapting therapy accordingly. So um, most of these disorders are relatively rare, even though I said 17%. That's for the entire population. But when you start subdividing it into gene for gene, the numbers start to get pretty small. And um, to then really start to explore how we improve, we have to think of um, complete international consensus building. So in 2017, 16, 17, um, a group of about 50 um, experts, quotation marks, uh, clini clinicians, pediatric oncologists, genetics, genetic counselors, radiologists, and so on, uh, came together on the auspices of the American Association for Cancer Research to come up with guidelines for about 50 different pediatric cancers in terms of what kinds of surveillance uh, could be put in place. And these have been published. There's the website for those who are interested. And these are used around the world and uh, are, are um, excellent um, guides for, for surveillance. Um, we're actually in the process of updating these, and um, over the next uh, few months, a new, uh, a, a new uh, site will be developed that will link so you can see what's, what's new. Um, the second is uh, books are published, and this one I was um, very uh, honored to edit a book on the hereditary basis of childhood cancer, um, 
which took an awfully long time to put together. And uh, as soon as it was published, the editor, or the publishers asked if we would put together another one, the next edition. And I said, uh, no, not yet, please. <laughs> we'll wait, wait a little bit. Um, and then uh, the third are things like this, which are apps that are now available. This is an example of one called MyPog uh, uh, for the McGill Pediatric Oncology um, uh, Genetics, I can't remember what the second G was for, uh, which was developed uh, primarily by Catherine Gowdy, who was a cancer genetics fellow at SickKids a few years back, and is an amazing app to identify, based on a personal family history of cancer, what the likelihood of there being a cancer predisposition underlying it and making uh, a, an appropriate referral for counseling and testing. So this is sort of a principle of how one does this work. And now I thought we'll dive into three examples of um, the power of, um, of, of these uh, disorders in understanding cancer biology um, and also clinical application. So the first and the next, uh, some of the next slides have been uh, um, um, uh, shared with me by Brigitte Wiedemann, who is the uh, uh, head of the Pediatric Oncology Branch at the National Institutes of Health and really a world expert in the study of neurofibromatosis. Um, neurofibromatosis, I think, as most, if not all of you, will be familiar with, is a uh, pretty common single gene disorder, about 1 in 3,500 individuals. Um, and, uh, and the um, uh, alterations uh, that occur in this um, disease are found in, in the so-called RAS pathway, and it's a fairly complex pathway of uh, cell signaling. Um, there's a gene which uh, is found on the long arm of chromosome 17, and a variety of uh, phenotypes are associated with NF1, particularly plexiform neurofibromas, which are benign, uh, and then atypical neurofibromas, um, and we'll see in a second, that can transform to malignant tumors or malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. One also sees optic gliomas, low-grade gliomas, and uh, juvenile uh, myelomonocytic uh, leukemia, um, which, uh, of course, is uh, a much more aggressive uh, disease. Um, so virtually every organ system can be involved. And this is one of the common features for many of the pediatric cancer uh, syndromes, is that multiple organs are involved. And that's somewhat distinct from the adult cancer disorders like breast ovarian cancer or Lynch syndrome, which tend to be relatively limited in their target organs. Um, whether that has to do with the fact that children are, are still embryologically developing, maybe there are uh, fewer fully differentiated uh, sites that allows for that, I don't think that's really clearly understood. The diagnostic criteria for this, as with other syndromes, continues to evolve as um, better phenotyping uh, goes on. But at least as of a couple of years ago, uh, these are the diagnostic criteria for um, for NF, uh, and uh, probably in a few years, perhaps these will change. Um, but one of the important things with all of these is as we understand more about the genetics of these syndromes, the um, a correlation of phenotype to genotype becomes critically important. And we're now at the point where, for many of them, with a particular variant or a particular class of variants, we can much more um, predict what kinds of cancer or at what ages they may develop. And this is critically important as we start to think of ways that we could actually interfere with um, uh, cancer progression. So. Um, it turns out at the moment that the correlations for NF1 are relatively few. Nonetheless, they are there. And these are some of the examples. Um, you can have micro deletions, large chunks of the chromosome deleted, and you get sort of a variety of phenotypes identified here, uh, whereas a particular uh, codon missense mis 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 mutation uh, here, uh, you get a somewhat different phenotype. So this is important to understand because um, coming into the clinic, of course, uh, uh, the sequencing is often the first thing that's, that's done. Um, the second, so that's in the germline. The second part is what's happening in the tumor itself, and so, or, or in the tissue, rather, itself. What are the somatic events that occur that may influence the phenotype? And so here um, we see that the cutaneous manifestations of neurofibromatosis, the neurofibromas that uh, we're familiar with, um, generally speaking, all one sees is uh, biallelic loss, I mean loss of both the um, uh, both copies of the NF1 gene, 
But as the phenotype progresses from the benign plexiform neurofibroma to the more malignant form, uh, one sees that you get more and more alterations in the tissue that have been acquired over time. And so uh, here we start seeing alterations, as I put a couple here in P53, which is a uh, seminal cancer uh, gene, uh, PRC2, and, and so on and so forth. So it, what it means is as tissues um, um, acquire more mutations, Mutations, they become more unstable, they have more propensity to proliferate, and, and therefore they are more likely to be malignant. The advantage of knowing this, however, is not only in uh, defining how these tissues progress to malignancy, but also they become potential targets for therapy. And these are just some of the examples of targets in this RAS pathway uh, that have been developed over the years, and you can see there are a lot of them. That doesn't Generally speaking, I'd like to think if there's a lot of them, it means none of them really work that well um, because you're constantly developing and developing. So we sure have not hit the holy grail as I had in the title for NF1, but um, we, we do know that little by little one gets closer and closer. How, how does this happen? Well, Dr. Wiedemann uh, has led a number of clinical trials out of the NIH looking at um, the patients who have progressive um, neurofibromas to see are there agents which can actually reduce their progression, not only in growth and size, but also in the propensity to transform to the malignant phenotype. So in the earlier days, it was about 10 years ago or so, um, one sees that uh, a variety of agents were being used, all these targeted agents, and overall, none, you know, they all sort of um, progressed over a period of time, and none of them were any better than the other. Um, and in fact, only about two of the 175 patients that they had treated at that time um, showed any sort of partial response. So this isn't ideal um, by any stretch of the imagination. But then um, in the uh, mid-2000, around 15, 14, uh, the introduction of one of the newer uh, agents called uh, selimitinib uh, was, um, was started, and phase two trials demonstrated in, um, plexifor in children with plexiform neurofibromas that you started to see responses much more consistently. And in this picture of this young boy, you can see here a uh, large plexiform neurofibroma, which is deforming his neck, and then over time, um, which would be about a year, uh, this thing has shrunk quite dramatically. And um, in this waterfall plot, we see that the vast majority of patients do have at least a partial response, and in uh, many of them, over half of them, a durable response. So they're maintained on these drugs, uh, but the responses are quite durable. What's also a value here is Almost all of these kinds of agents are oral, so they're relatively easier to take than coming back and forth to the hospital. Their toxicity profiles are, generally speaking, milder than for conventional chemotherapy and such. And chemotherapy doesn't work for these tumors because they're not highly proliferating uh, tumors. So you're reusing agents which are essentially cytostatic and not cytotoxic. Um, so this shows promise as one of the newer agents, and when you map it against the uh, more older ones, you can see that there is a uh, significant and fairly dramatic uh, impact on progression in, 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 a, in a favorable uh, way. Um, now, clinical trials are continuing, and one of the challenges is, do any of these agents really work in the context here of the malignant phenotypes, uh, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, uh, the JMML, and unfortunately, for the most part, the, these agents are not as effective in the context of uh, full-blown malignancy, which is already um, in place. And so you start having to treat those uh, lesions with more conventional chemotherapeutic approaches. Um, and, uh, and, and this, of course, is a problem. So the idea is, can we interfere? Can we, can we actually come in uh, knowing and following these patients with the uh, more benign phenotype and try to prevent that malignant transformation, knowing that the likelihood of effective therapy at that point is substantially less. So being on lifelong preventive therapy uh, may be, as difficult as that is, uh, um, more likely to, to give a uh, um, good outcome than, uh, than waiting for the tumor to actually fully transform and be malignant. Um, so, uh, so leave that point. 
And that then gets to this um, idea that as the, as I mentioned before, you have this mole molecular evolution that's associated with um, malignant progression. So the idea would be, can we use any of these agents to kind of interfere in these early stages to prevent these late stages? So doing that's one thing. How do you kind of figure out when to intervene? And um, so I'm gonna take a slight diversion for a couple of slides and then we'll come back to this particular diversion in the uh, last part of the talk in, uh, as well. So um, for those of you who are um, kind of aficionados of some molecular biology, molecular genetics, um, on the right-hand side of the screen, um, I show you a uh, nucleosome um, here. So we have two nucleosomes, which are the little protein bodies, complexes, that DNA wraps itself around. Um, and it to, as, as it's stabilized um, across the genome. And then in between two nucleosomes, we have what we call linker DNA, which is about 20 or 40 base pairs in length. The stuff wrapped around the nucleosome is in the neighborhood of about 150 base pairs in length. Um, and you'll see why this may be of some importance in a second. So when um, DNA in our body, whether it's from inflammation, it's from injury, it's from cells just naturally dying off, the DNA from those cells, um, as they explode, as they're destroyed, uh, basically gets shed into the bloodstream and eventually just um, DNAs, enzymes, chew it all up and, and you don't see it. But you can measure at small nanogram quantities uh, this DNA. You can see it, you can find it, and it's normal. The size of these fragments tends to be either about 150 bases, in other words, the stuff wrapped around and protected by the nucleosome, or 300 and whatever, approximately 350, which is basically two nucleosomes together, plus the, plus the linker. So that would be normal, and when you run that on a gel, you can see um, sort of a band here at 150 bases, and up here, uh, 350 bases. Take my word for it, that's what it's showing. Um, now, when in cancer cells, chromatin is unwound, much more commonly unwound. So what happens here is there's more loose, if you will, DNA available for DNA's enzymes coming along and chopping it up. So in cancer-derived DNA, from cancer cells that are dying off and shedding their DNA into the bloodstream, uh, the fragments tend to be shorter. And they can be substantially shorter in the neighborhood of 120 bases or 100 bases. So you can, make the, you can do those measurements. Well, why is this of any real relevance or importance? Um, I'm going to skip that slide. And um, it's work that's done here by a colleague of mine at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, which is the big adult cancer center in Toronto, Trevor Pugh and a cancer geneticist, Raymond Kim, uh, who sees all the adult patients that are transitioned uh, out of our program at SickKids. And what um, Trevor and his team have done is they've um, taken this concept in neurofibromatosis, looking at about 240 healthy controls and a number of patients with colleagues at uh, WashU, actually, and um, as well as the patients at, at, uh, in Toronto. These are all adults. And what you see on the top here is Patients who are healthy basically have larger fragments of DNA measured in their blood because they're healthy. They don't have malignant tumor cells floating around their body. Patients who have a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors have very high fraction of smaller, in pink, fragments of DNA. But look at this population in the middle. So these are individuals who actually have plexiform neurofibromas but you can see some of them are primarily healthy circulating tumor DNA, and some of them are primarily malignant circulating tumor DNA. So one would make the argument that these patients are perhaps already developing malignant transformation of their plexiform neurofibromas, and you want to be able to find them. And at the same time, these are the patients over here that may progress to these and therefore you could start thinking of treating them up front and, and avoiding that progression. So this concept of using biomarkers to find that transition between benign and malignant transformation of cells is critically important, and we'll see a little bit more of that shortly. So that's the story around neurofibromatosis.
but there's a um, sort of a blurring of the lines, if you will, between a lot of the clinical phenotypes. And I know that geneticists and uh, genetic counselors here will understand the value and importance of really phenotyping patients well. And a number of years ago, probably about 20 years ago, this relatively newly described, and it wasn't new because it's always been there probably for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, but newly described disorder called um, constitutional mismatch repair deficiency or, or biallelic mismatch repair deficiency was described in which the phenotype is not that dissimilar from uh, neurofibromatosis. In fact, they get cafe au lait spots, um, they, get, they have um, family histories of a variety of cancers, um, but some of them in particular are a little different. They get GI cancers, uh, and a particularly striking feature is a fairly high uh, frequency of consanguinity among, um, in the parents. So this constitutional mismatch repair deficiency is not caused by the NF1 gene, totally different gene pathway. What it is caused by is by allelic, so both uh, alleles, one from mom, one from dad, presumably, or one from one parent and the other uh, a post-meiotic uh, event, um, in the microsatellite um, pathway, which I'll show on the next slide uh, what that means. And what happens is in the adult world, one sees something called Lynch syndrome, where you get one hit in the germline of this particular pathway, and it's very commonly uh, GI or GU cancers, and pretty much nothing else very, very rarely occurs. The mean age of on onset is sort of older in the, in the 40s or 50s. In these patients, the mean onset of age is around nine years. They're at risk of glioblastomas or high-grade brain tumors, high-grade GI cancers, and lymphomas. So a somewhat different and way more aggressive phenotype. What this pathway does, this is one of the um, DNA repair pathways that repairs tiny single base mutations that are occurring thousands of times a day in us um, and every cell in our body. But fortunately, hopefully all of us or the vast majority of us are repairing it regularly so nothing happens. In these patients, they've lost that ability to repair. And in addition, they've lost the ability because they get a secondary mutation in a polymerase gene, they've lost the ability to, um, the, the two saviors for this kind of uh, mutation analysis, uh, mutation repair are both lost, okay? So the brake's gone, um, the brake's badly gone, the car's fallen apart, and there's no way to repair it. The spectrum of tumors is far wider than we see in NF1, and this is a um, publication, there's an update to this, but it's more or less the same, showing that virtually every um, tumor has been reported at least once in these, um, in these patients, primarily though brain tumors, GI cancers, and hematologic malignancies. So back in around 2015, an amazing cancer genomics um, colleague of mine, Adam Schlein, who happened to do his PhD with, uh, um, in my lab uh, a few years before that, um, working with uh, Uri Tabori, Dr. Tabori, uh, who has done a lot of work in this field, um, demonstrated, in fact, using deep sequencing technologies that the tumors, particularly the brain tumors, is what they were studying at the time, in these patients, in the tumors themselves had a very high mutational burden. In other words, a high frequency of mutations in the actual tumor. Mutations in cancer sometimes um, have a, um, if, if, what happens is that, that you end up with um, significantly unstable DNA, but you're also then creating proteins and neoantigens were ex which are expressed by the tumor cells, which may be targets for these things called immune checkpoint inhibitors. And you can see here that in the normal pediatric popula cancer population, or cancers from, from patients who don't have this disorder, the number of uh, mutations per tumor are really low. That's one of the classic things about childhood cancer. We call them a relatively quiet genome because there's not a lot of mutations. Other things are going on which cause the cancer, translocations, infusions, and things. In the adult world, it's a little bit more common, and particularly in GI cancers and melanoma, you see high frequencies of mutations, right? So these immune checkpoint inhibitors are used very commonly in the adult world. What Uri and his colleagues and uh, Eric Buffet, who was the head of neuro-oncology at SickKids and just recently retired, although he didn't really retire, um, it, it, it treated two patients here, both of whom, and they were siblings, and both of whom had um, fairly substantial uh, glioblastoma multiforme, had failed multiple treatments prior to that, 
and started them on nivolumab, uh, one of the immune checkpoint inhibitors. And you can see after 12 weeks of therapy uh, in this patient, the tumor um, has all but had all but disappeared. Uh, and in this uh, patient, after eight weeks, um, there's a substantial in reduction on the tumor on these scans. This was the first report of some degree of success using this uh, approach. And, um, and we'll see in a second where that's gone. The second is an example of a young boy who had a glioblastoma as well as colorectal cancer with metastases to the wrist seen here. And after about three months of one of the other inhibitors, uh, you see healing of the fracture. And in fact, the colon cancer here disappeared. Okay, this was not resected. This was actually um, um, responded with, with um, immunotherapy. Now, in all of the ones I've just given you, they have all eventually recurred. They've all eventually acquired resistance, but it was at least um, some sense uh, that was uh, published a couple of years ago, or last year rather, uh, demonstrating that, um, in fact, you are getting significant and durable responses to immune checkpoint inhibition uh, in uh, the brain tumors in the, um, uh, and, and in the GI tumors, not so much in the leukemias and lymphomas um, for reasons that are not totally understood, but probably due to the rapidity of onset of those malignancies. So this is exciting because you're now taking the germline event that's informing the phenotype and you can actually jump in with these therapies um, ahead of time that are unique to the tumors that you anticipate developing uh, here. And so Uri and his colleagues are now developing this concept of tumor interference where you don't even let the tumor happen. So we're starting a prophylactic uh, study of using these agents um, in combination to see if you can actually prevent the tumor onset because the likelihood of cancer in these patients before the age of about 15 is well over 70%. It's the most highly penetrant uh, that we know, cancer predisposition disorder. Um, there is some genotype-phenotype dependency, as I mentioned earlier on with the NF story. Uh, the phenotype is somewhat similar, but with the response to therapy definitely changes uh, as um, time, as um, depending uh, both on the uh, on the tumor type. But here you see the different mutations. Uh, in, on this kaplan meier curve yield different responses to therapy. So knowing the mu underlying mutation can guide uh, what you might expect in terms of outcomes, and, and this sort of the same thing. This actually was just published earlier this year. I just realized I hadn't updated that um, review just last month. Um, so again, highlighting the need to work in large cohort, uh, consortia because these diseases are relatively uncommon and uh, there's an international replication repair deficiency consortium and many of these patients, as you can see based on the map, uh, come from, uh, shall we say, the under-resourced uh, regions of the world, particularly uh, the Middle East and uh, South Asia um, and partly reflecting um, some of the genotypes uh, that we that we understand. We see quite a bit of it in Toronto, actually, partly because of the demographics of the city, which is about 50% um, first generation, where it's about 60% actually first generation uh, Canadian. Okay, and then the last example, and we'll leave uh, uh, with, is um, Lifraumeni syndrome, which um, you've heard is an area that I've studied for, I guess, since I've finished my <laughs> postdoctoral training and clinical training. Um, and it is uh, sort of a disease that I think falls a little bit in the middle of the uh, other two that we've described. So this is an example of a pedigree of a family uh, that um, was seen, actually not one of our families, seen by Josh Schiffmans, who's at uh, Utah Salt Lake City, that describes in a sense what this disease is all about, where you get multiple autosomal dominant inheritance, multiple cancers and in multiple um, individuals. So here you have a young uh, man who passed away around the age of 30, uh, having had two distinct sarcomas. Uh, here's a child had an adrenal cortical carcinoma, developed a choroid plexus carcinoma, uh, low-grade tumors, high-grade tumors, the whole, the whole uh, nine yards. Now, the um, incidence of cancer is somewhere in the neighborhood of 40% in the childhood young adult uh, range, and the lifetime risk approaches 100% in women uh, with a high breast cancer risk and, uh, and pretty high in males as well. But this is another uh, ma uh, young man. So he's a patient of mine who's now just transitioned. He's 19, transitioned to the adult uh, program. And you can see here in his uh, first 16 years of life, uh, developed four um, malignant lesions. Okay, the polyps weren't malignant, but they would have been if we left them in. Uh, he developed a, a melanoma when he was 12, and, um, and, and these as well. 
What's remarkable is not only he developed four or five cancers in his 16 years, but he survived them all. Uh, and um, we're, of course, watching him uh, terribly closely uh, as we need to. So the gene associated with this particular um, disease is uh, p53. Uh, and p53 is a classic tumor suppressor that is involved in different aspect of DNA repair than the microsatellite genes um, in that it recognizes double-strand DNA breaks and then activates a whole process of downstream functions uh, which lead to apoptosis or programmed cell death, uh, growth arrest um, to allow the cell to repair, or the DNA to repair itself. If it doesn't repair, then the cell dies. Uh, and then um, senescence and, and a variety of other metabolic and other functions that are ongoing and continuing to be described. So the question back in, um, in 2000-ish, 1999, when we initiated and started the cancer genetics program at SickKids was, um, what can you do? This is not and still isn't really a very druggable gene. There aren't any real good therapies out there uh, for p53, um, both in the somatic cancer sense as well as in the germline. So the question is, can anything be done about this? And uh, we decided to set up a protocol of surveillance looking to see if we could detect tumors early based on the simple premise that if you detect cancers early, they generally do better than not. So we created a protocol which included whole body MRI imaging uh, annually, brain imaging annually, ultrasounds, bringing kids in every three months for blood work, physical exam, and so on. It is a very onerous um, approach, but uh, work that was done um, at the time, first uh, when she was a resident, Anita Villani, so for those pediatric residents on the uh, here or, or, or online, um, this is the kind of thing that you sometimes luck into, I joke with Anita. So she was a resident looking for a project. Uh, we said, why don't you do this and write the uh, experience up? And so in 2011, she published her first Lancet Oncology paper. Um, and then in 2016, we did a long-term follow-up. And so she has two Lancet Oncology papers. One, one is a resident, one is a fellow. And she's now uh, co-directs the cancer genetics program with me. Um, and what we were able to show is that there is a significant survival advantage for patients who undergo surveillance compared to those who do not. So what does that mean? Well, here is an example um, that was um, a kid who was followed uh, by us since she was born. She's now 17 years old. So she was in a family with a striking family history of cancer. And at birth, um, she was tested and found to have a germline p53 mutation. Whole body MRI in February 2020 was entirely unremarkable. Um, take my word for that. That's the radiologist to tell me. And, um, but, and, and she was clinically very well. And then in February 2021, she came for her routine um, a imaging study, which we don't have control over timing. I'm sure like you, the MRIs are just booked and you kind of work with that. And um, there was bilateral um, marrow uptake. And consistent with leukemia. She was not symptomatic. She had a few little aches and pains, but she carries around a knapsack, nothing, nothing unusual. And in fact, five weeks before, four weeks before, she had been in for her regular blood work, which was completely unremarkable, even in retrospect. Um, and it turned out, however, that she had pre-BALL, mass hypodiploid ALL, and after induction on high-risk protocol, had 5% MRD. At that point, remember, P53 is a DNA damage repair gene. She doesn't have any damage repair pathway in her leukemic cells, and she has clearly at risk of other samples. So we had a long discussion with our leukemia group, our transplant group, and decided to actually go straight to CAR T therapy for her. Um, she had a little bit of bridge chemo just to get everything going, but she had CAR T and um, at uh, now around 120 weeks or so, uh, a little bit less than that, she remains uh, MRD negative. And Ron Urbinovitz was a fellow in the cancer genetics program, recently uh, returned to Israel, who, um, who followed her not just for surveillance early, but then um, happened to pick her up and continued to manage her leukemia uh, as well. So I'm going to come back to that story in a second. But the question is, what can we follow in, in these patients? The only thing they have in common is that they have a germline p53 mutation, but they get all sorts of different kinds of cancers. And so the question is, could we ever come up with a biomarker of early detection that um, for this young lady, who I'll name Juliet, and uh, 
she's, because um, that's her name, and uh, she's, uh, she, what is it about hers that is different than anybody else's? What is about her, can her leukemia that's different than the other young man who had multiple cancers? So Nick Light, a uh, MD-PhD student in the lab, now um, doing a residency in internal medicine, and did a study where he took a wide number of um, tumors uh, from Lifromani patients uh, with a um, um, variety of different cancers and basically microdissected out uh, regions that were maybe a millimeter or two apart and did deep sequencing. And we were saying, wouldn't it be amazing if we had a molecular signature for Lifromani syndrome tumors? And then if we find that, we know there's a tumor somewhere floating around with that circulating tumor DNA. This is a really complicated slide, but I'm just going to highlight, on the top is just the demographics of the different cancers, but down here, uh, sorry, up here, uh, we see what we call signatures. This is where we were looking for the signatures. And what we were hoping for is when you do whole genome sequencing or any genome sequencing, you actually can look through the entire genome, look for patterns, like a signature of the, of the tumors. For the most part, we didn't find anything, with the one exception being that they all lose the wild copy, the normal copy of P53. So we know that they have really lousy P53 DNA repair. But the other interesting finding was here. So in these two patients and one over here, um, you'll see that there is a signature marked in purple or magenta uh, there. And what that is, is actually a signature associated with prior treatment with carboplatinum, with platinum-derived drugs, which are common in many of the cancers that that one treats. Nick didn't realize it at the time because he was blinded, but both of these patients, this was the second tumor that he was sequencing, and they had both been previously treated years before for another cancer with platinum. And, um, and what it suggests is that the damage that's caused by these drugs is pervasive years later and we think probably had something to do, perhaps, with the ultimate development of these secondary malignancies. So there is some explanation, perhaps, of why second tumors do occur. The other thing we were looking for is maybe in the single changes in other genes, there are some things that are common. Like maybe there's a gene X, which commonly is mutated in these tumors, and that's the signature we can use. But in fact, what this part of the slide really shows is that there are all sorts of different tumors, uh, patients along the line here, all sorts of different genes. And even just looking at a very high level, there's really nothing consistent from patient to patient to patient. Different tumors have different variants um, reflecting sort of the um, spectrum of alterations in many, many genes that it can occur in cancer. Many of them are in other DNA repair pathways, but none to be able to kind of create a true gene signature. So what we suggested from this is that the alterations that occur in Lifromani syndrome at a genetic level occur extremely early. They lose the normal, other normal copy in those tissues that puts them at risk very early, sometimes probably um, um, years before. But nothing really happens until they acquire other alterations in the tumor cells, and then it explodes and becomes a full-blown malignancy. So we want to interfere with this process either by coming up with agents that can kind of block that, or at the very least, better surveillance strategies that we can de detect these early changes, and perhaps someday these patients don't need to be constantly coming in for all their imaging and physical exams and, and blood work and, and so on. So that leads me then to the last uh, five minutes or so uh, to tell you um, a story which um, was just published yesterday um, online. So this is about, so I had to change all these things from do not post to you can post it as much as you want. Um, so this is an amazing collaboration with colleagues, uh, again, Trevor Pugh, Raymond, and Derek, who's a postdoc in Trevor's lab. Um, and this is uh, a paper, so it's actually posted online before print, and we know there's a bunch of errors. They haven't sent us the galley proofs yet, including a couple of individuals that we need to get in because it's a long authorship list. Um, so a little few changes, but the basic uh, study is, is absolutely complete. So we took a cohort of adult and pediatric patients with Lifromani syndrome with tumors in various different sites. And the idea was to develop a panel based on this concept of circulating tumor DNA to see if we would be able to detect tumors early. And the panel is actually different from what is basically in the literature for 
almost all of the circulating tumor DNA in sporadic cancer panels, which are usually a single alteration. So for example, it, there are clinical trials in the adult world for patients with colon cancer where we know they uh, have a very high propensity to have a, a point mutation in the KRAS gene. And so you can look for that point mutation in the blood, right? And you know then it's coming from the cancer. So a patient comes in with colon cancer, you check their blood, they have a ridiculously high level of KRAS mutations in their circulating tumor DNA. Then they get surgery, they get chemotherapy, and that level drops to pretty much undetectable, which is great, they're in remission. Then you just need to follow that every few months, and as long as it's down there, we're good. But if you start seeing it come up, then you go hunting around for where the recurrence is or the metastasis. But it's a single alteration. Well, I told you, the problem with leaf romani patients is their tumors, there's no two alike at a molecular level. So looking for a single thing will be fairly pointless. So what we did is created with Trevor a, um, a multi-omic approach where we look at whole genome sequencing, low passage, so it's cheaper and uh, you can cover a lot. Uh, we look for rearrangements. We look for um, uh, uh, patient-specific patient panels or tumor-specific panels. Uh, we have um, um, chromatin remodeling or methylation profiling because we're looking for epigenetic changes. And so basically, and we're also looking for fragment size. So basically, we're looking for anything. And anything abnormal tells us there's cancer. Doesn't tell us what it is, doesn't tell us where it is, but it says there's a problem. Um, and then you can go hunting. So in the analysis uh, uh, here, we had um, 26 patients in this part of the study uh, with cancer and then 77 without. So these are all p53 mutation carriers. 26 of them already had cancer. We wanted to see if we could find it. And then 77 did not, at the time of the study, yet have cancer. In the first who had cancer, we can see all of them have a germline p53 mutation. No surprise there. Um, some of them, about half, developed a second mutation derived from the cancer found in the blood, and then the question is, well, well, all these ones, we couldn't find anything else. A few have secondary mutations. I'll get to that in the next slide. In this group, these are patients who don't have cancer that we can see. But you can see there's already a small proportion that have a second mutation, so they do have something. There's no other physiologic reason why you should have mutant P53 floating around in the blood unless there's a malignancy. Uh, and then they have, some of them have other mutations also suggesting something is going on. So we get back to Juliet, and this is Juliet's scan, the normal one, and what we see here is a methylation score, meaning a pattern of methylation across the genome that is essentially normal, normal for many, many, many months. We've been collecting it every three to four months on her, and then you start seeing it start to tick up a little. A tumor fracture, we look for copy number alterations in the DNA, normal, normal, normal at the time of this normal scan, and then in this case, 11 months later, there's an abnormal scan, and you see the abnormality of a new p53 mutation as well as an abnormal methylation score. What is of note is it started to uptick several months before the scan. This is acute lymphoblastic leukemia several months before. That goes against what we think of acute leukemia, which is always thought to be very rapid. So it suggests that the biomarker is there. Now, one make me the argument in leukemia, maybe that wouldn't make any difference. But for solid tumors, it could make a big difference. Um, the other thing we noted is the proportion of small fragments, fragments of DNA uh, is um, significantly higher in people who carry a p53 germline mutation with or without cancer than it is in the normal population or in people with other types of uh, malignancy. Um, and the third piece is we looked at something called a methyl, as I mentioned, the methylation score. In this case, for breast cancer, we were looking for, these are more in the adults, and we found that patients who had no cancers, a portion of them have an abnormality in their breast cancer signature, suggesting that they will go on or they already have a very, very tiny breast cancer that you can then go hunting for. What's a little disconcerting is there was one patient here in the healthy control sample who also had an abnormal breast methylation score, but of course breast cancer is still relatively common in women, and it's possible that individual actually sporadically was developing breast cancer. 
And so the last sort of data slide then, the last couple of slides, really just shows that for different individuals, the pattern of alterations in this multi-omic approach was different, but they all had something, or at least all that showed something, had something unusually abnormal. And that suggests that we need to go and hunt them down. We picked up a melanoma, an osteosarcoma, two brain tumors in the pediatric population, all using this technology. It was a retrospective study, so there was no real time. A clinical trial is now starting in the new year across the country to do this for patients with hereditary breast cancer, Lynch syndrome, leaf romani syndrome, and neurofibromatosis, and we'll expand it to um, the U.S., of course. The false positive rate is still fairly high, so we need to work on that because then you're going hunting for something that doesn't exist. Uh, but the false negative rate is extremely low, okay? So the uh, negative predictive value is about 98%, which is important. You're not missing things. So what this means then ultimately is the future state is rather than doing massive amount of imaging in all these patients with hereditary cancer, we now start to think of ways that a relatively simple blood test done periodically in a local lab and then sent down to a core lab uh, should be able to pick up these risks and then you incorporate all this screening to, to find the tumor. And down the road, the next step of course is to develop these technologies so they actually are able to identify specific cancers rather than at the moment, it's still fairly broad with the exception of breast cancer. So as I mentioned, this came out, and this is, I think, uh, this is Juliet and her mom. Uh, the, uh, this was picked up by the press, and uh, like we say, uh, this is an article that was above the fold yesterday. The Toronto Star is sort of like the Washington Post, sort of a national paper based out of Toronto uh, with, with wide, wide readership. They're an amazing, amazing family, as are, of course, all the ones that we work with. So in the future, um, this is really the approach, genome-based sequencing, germline genetic landscape uh, informing uh, targeting and, and um, um, toxicity, morbidity, designing novel therapies. You heard a little bit about that. What I didn't talk about at all is this excitement that's brewing and looking at the microbiome in particular and its influence on genetic risk, uh, looking more at other approaches to cDNA, and also what I didn't touch on, many, many studies around the world um, describing and, and exploring the psychosocial impact of this constant surveillance and these patients who basically have Damocles sword hanging over their head waiting for the next cancer uh, and how do, you, uh, how do you deal with that. All of this work is inspiring, inspired by many, and this is from the Leif Romani um, uh, workshop uh, a couple of few years ago in Toronto, and this is a group of uh, teenagers from around the world, all of whom are P53 mutation carriers with Leif Romani syndrome. Uh, Dr. Uh, Romani and Drs. Levine and Lane, who co-discovered the P53 gene, um, and this interaction of children with the scientists, with the clinician, uh, clinicians is remarkable, and we actually have annual workshops for the adolescents. Uh, to, so they can talk with each other. And then um, uh, one of my patients who I've followed since she was about three years old and had two malignancies, the last one showing she was 17, an osteosarcoma, um, and uh, she had a bilateral mastectomy when she was 23. And um, then last year, just about a year ago, uh, gave birth to Knox and uh, brought Knox to the hospital for all of us to see and uh, he does not carry a mutation in P53. He's a healthy little guy, and uh, really that is, of course, what inspires all of us in all the work that we do is our patients and, uh, and, uh, and their stories. So I'll leave it there. Thank everybody in the lab and all our collaborators, funding um, sources, and as I mentioned before, all the families we work with. I have one question. You talked about using inhibitor therapy sort of proactively before people develop cancer, but you also mentioned that patients who are being treated for cancer developed resistance. Um, is that a concern when you're using it preventatively that the resistance will make it such that once they develop a cancer, it's not going to work anymore? Yeah, I think absolutely cor correct. And that's going to be the challenge going forward. And the problem um, that I see is some of these studies that may take a long time before we actually detect that. Uh, uh, resistance. One of the approaches that, um, at least in the context of the biallelic mismatch repair, is using um, multimodal therapy and not depending on one, not like the, the one inhibitor. And so there are, the study now that's going on is actually using two uh, different inhibitors, um, hoping that that may abrogate it. But absolutely, I think that will be something we have to worry about.
Thank you. We have a question from Raj, Raj Kapoor, who is joining us online. How do you distinguish a false positive result from cell-free DNA tests from early malignancy, not detectable yet by other means? How do you deal with the stress this type of discrepancy must cause for patients? Yeah. So uh, the false positive uh, is a concern with us because it, all it means is at that point in time, we couldn't find anything, but we've actually just obviously demonstrated that these, these um, Positive results are happening months before the cancer develops, so it's very possible that they would uh, develop something. And we just, you know, the end of the study happened before we had that um, final um, check. So, so they would end up at the moment. The plan is that they would; these patients would end up going back while well, they're already on surveillance, and we're just keeping an eye on them. And the um, psychosocial, psychological stress is significant. It's already significant, and we have good data on that from the regular Toronto protocol, uh, and that you know. Way for the result. We, we actually have the kids come in for their ultrasounds in the morning of the clinic, so they get ultrasound blood work, then they see us, so we have those results as they come into clinic. The MRIs are the only things we don't have control over timing. We just call them within a day or two of when we get the results. That would be apply here as well. As part of the clinical trial, we have actually a psychosocial component to that trial to exactly explore the question. Really great, and thank you for that question. That was good. We're just about out of time. Thank you yeah. so much for coming down and speaking with us today. And thank you everyone for being here both online and in the room. And we'll see everybody next week.